I will probably fail at making a, an abstract synthesis of, um, of essentially what it seems to be the same complaint that I have against uh, all these different styles of ideology and uh, uh, it, it really is very similar to what um, Catherine um, Elgin is uh, complaining about or uh, w w when she talks about veritism um, and the kind of a a a and it's it's problematic um, epistemological sort of a project and outlook which uh and and i i think i got into some describing almost some mechanics of how that essentially fatally always falls short fatalistically will always fall short um uh and how it essentially has to sort of obfuscate its own internal tautological sort of certainty um by essentially disguising it in the sort of uh, dispersing it within a kind of um, grand orthodoxy, essentially, uh, th th that essentially uh, somehow always has purchase and cannot be escaped and, and must be answered. And therefore, sort of from that sense of, of presumed moral authority can always pose to its critics a kind of, you know, you have to uh, uh, prove... Uh, uh, you, you have to overcome skepticism uh, in order to, to even have a seat at the table at being able to, you know, to start to challenge the orthodoxy. Uh, you know, so you, you sort of, you, you put other people on, on such, in such a way, uh, uh, so far on, on, on the back foot that they, um, you know, that they, they have to prove a negative, uh, you know, and you've just essentially assumed the default ground, you know, or, 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 or that you, you have, assume that your own philosophical position, which is vague and embarrassingly um, uh, sort of uh, is, is, is beyond reproach and is sort of off limits uh, because, you know, it must just get away with its description of itself instead of actually being convincing, actually, you know, being reasoned. So it's sort of, it, it can be the sort of this vague sort of distant, uh, um, uh, um, you know, its process essentially can substitute for uh, uh, its um, its its process of progress can substitute for the realization of its supposed um, vision of itself in the future. Uh, that those two things can be taken as as representative of one another, and and you're not even allowed to ask for a positive argument of substantiation uh, for that promise, essentially. Um, in fact, you have to prove a negative in order to reproach that kind of uh, uh, self-gratifying um, uh, uh, conceit. Uh, and, you know, I mean... It, 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 you know the pseudo intellectualism to me is 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 really pathetic because you know you know it doesn't take you know in, unless you have absolutely no experience in actual discourse and if you've never had an intellectual an intellectually humble moment in your fucking life you know you you should be able to understand what it sounds like when someone's fucking begging the question you know but no these people are immune to this you know, so I mean, I, I don't know what kind of, you know, and, and these are people that have been trained in philosophy departments. These are people who are post-grad philosophy people, you know. So what what the fuck? You, you know, you really have to ask yourself, what, what are these pseudo-intellectual, uh, uh, you know, uh, corruption houses essentially propping up? You know, I mean, if, if philosophy students can get away with this kind of puerile uh, uh, vacuous uh, uh, bullshit and and so of course it infests the academy of course it's it's proliferates you know th this this corruption um uh, and this is what academia has essentially uh, uh, uh this is more often than not the character of academia i mean even the the, the grand uh, uh universities um have fallen to to this brittle you know uh, um world view of which essentially is is just to sort of you know 
a kind of wishful thinking gambit, you know, it, it's sort of, um, but, you know, I, I guess, you know, this is what happens when you have a corrupted sort of uh, scientific moral authority or, or at least epistemological authority or something like that. Uh, and everything is just sort of has 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 modeled itself off of the scientific sort of Ponzi scheme. Um, and 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 this is why I'm always harsh when Catherine Elgin does not actually is not more blunt about essentially the um uh the cultural um uh, uh i'm just trying to think how do you make an adjective out of the word philistine uh you know the the, the cultural philistinianism uh, uh that that has infected and, uh, you know, and, and these kinds of pseudo intellectuals, you know, I mean, they abound everywhere, you know, and they're fucking famous, you know, Sam Harris, you know, the, the, the kind of, you know, the, the amount of aligned rationalism that you can have with this kind of um, essentially wishful thinking uh, at the core of it as the, the sort of tautological self-satisfied uh, 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 collateral system of uh, th that can support a whole array of positivism that that somehow uh, uh can coherently constrain itself and structure itself you know it, it, it's uh, you know how how abstractly or conceptually do people even think that you can orchestrate su su such a um yeah i mean and essentially, I mean, I guess this is why they always try to mystify agnosticism, essentially, and why agnosticism is seen to be a kind of virtue that is cashed out in a very particular way, that it, it's logical and it's rational and it's reasonable, that agnosticism sort of leads you on to a very particular kind of invest investigative uh, 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 sort of um, journey uh, that that essentially can conform under some uh, common rubric of of a, a kind of uh, moral science. Um, and and science that has a kind of uh, uh, materialistic uh, uh, foundation of, of, of its certitude and, and of its claims. Um, I mean, you know, it, it, it's it, which is obviously it's important it's impossible to have a normative system based on on such um precepts you know because they'll never be principles because how will you judge them how how will you measure them what will you measure them against you know i mean you, you essentially have to table thumb something like darwinism and say well it it makes us better darwinists essentially or, or something like that um and you know the, oh. Don't even get me. You, know, you see, it, it's always just sort of passing the buck onto a, another sort of collateral uh, department, uh, and somehow they're all mutually supportive of this of this universal project of 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 you know. And, and no one ever answers the question. They just say, "Well, it's in the network. It's in the sort of you know. It, it's a combination of those sorts of things. It's like the same kind of pseudo intellectualism of the people who." Um, well, I can't even remember what it's called. It's funny because uh, I I met one of these people, one of the five people that supposedly understand the um, I can't remember what it's called. It has a nifty little name, but it basically means the people who believe uh, who understand the world according essentially to the more Newtonian models of you know so so um, they they have got like a rationalized uh, uh, ethos in terms of they have an actual. Um, mechanical understanding of how the different spheres of science sort of uh, interpenetrate each other and how they interrelate each other and then you know sort of the uh, and and how to compartmentalize the kind of uh uh the more strange stuff uh which isn't quite understood but but all the other sort of realms of science which have essentially um been finished you know like like chemistry is for example finished and such um 
and so they've got a very intricate understanding of how the billiard balls, you know, uh, sort of um, how motion on that plane of, of that level of interpretation and how it integrates with all the other hard models. And, you know, I mean, it, it's quite funny because well, Catherine Elgin has, has beautiful, essentially, refutations on essentially the, the, the epistemological merit of those sorts of, of, of conceited conceptions. I'm not going to go into it, but anyway. Um, I just wish that she would take some of that insight and she would actually uh, craft a spear and sort of actually uh, point at the, the kind of claim that is made or that is suggested because they never, you know, in a technical way, they always guard themselves because essentially they will always say the right caveats at the right place, but their whole culture, their whole um, sentiment and, and their whole, uh, you know, it, it's strange. They, they sort of, they say both things. They say, you know, we are discovering the truth, but, you know, science is not a thing that can ever touch the truth or know the truth. Uh, you know, we can just model the best that we can, but that is the best that humanity, humanity can do, and that is humanity's truth uh, as, as the best that we can know it. So it's weird. They sort of, they apologize for it, and then they say, well, that's all there is, and that's the deepest thing ever, and actually uh, we are displacing the metaphysicians essentially um and you know so so they they kind of have this undertone this underhanded sort of double speak um to get into their fudged ponzi scheme essentially you know it's um and 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 this this is quite the same way uh, in which even, you know, I mean, this is metaphorical for the whole intellectual corruption that has happened within the academy uh, and within intellectualism in general. Um, you know, the reliance on statistics, the, the reliance on generalizations, the, the re reliance on sociological analysis and sociological entities as being ontologically prime and, and also prime in terms of their moral consideration. And so you have moral consideration in as much as you are a representative of this group entity. And so, you know, identity, you know, essentially it's a pantheon of identities. You know, you, they have invented this sort of this new invocation of a, of a kind of neo perennialism uh, that has been cashed out in this in, in this particular um, cosmological uh, uh, designated you know, stratification um, and and so you know we've all been given a kind of objective uh, uh, objectified um, label in in this beastly ghastly conditioned matrix uh, and and you know this is the mark of the beast if if you know uh, the, the, this is what's going on and um I mean, that, that's uh, spiritually, you have to understand that the beast is, is very metaphorical. The, the beast has no free will. The beast is conditioned by its desires and its environment and, 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 and its passions. Uh, it, it does not have choice. It, it does not reason. Uh, it, is, it is merely imprinted upon. It, it moves... Uh, uh, it moves to to uh, accord with its fear and lust. You know, it it, it sort of um, anyway. Uh, and 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 its fear and lust are all reactive uh, uh, properties. Uh, it has no real conception of its own character. Uh, therefore, it is a beast. Um, and in the same way, identity as it has been promulgated uh, to imprint within people ideologically, so it, it is the mark of the beast. Um, and, and people are lining up to have it, uh, to, to adopt it, um, uh, to care for, for this uh, uh, hollow vessel this vehicle uh, to use as a political vehicle as as a uh, um, a, a spiritual um, node of of their experience you know and and so so this is you know has been encoded into their their, their um, 
a pollution of the language, you know, so, so you know, it, it all gets, the ideology now gets woven into regular words as they try to sort of uh, take over the, the, the public discourse and the public sphere. So, you know, lived experience, you know, you, you, you've got sort of these, these sort of buzzwords that are charged with their ideological charges um, uh, within their spider web, their, their sort of their borderline uh, disordered uh, a spider web stereotyped uh, narrative and and projection um, and that is where they are trapped and and they are uh, I've described them before as zombies um, but you know followers of the beast you know is you know the, they, they have no reason reasoning faculty they have no normative uh, a view of things they have no normative framework uh, is, is just sort of image thinking. They're just comparing these things to the image th that is concocted and, and sort of uh, coalesced from their, um, from the system of expectations, essentially, uh, th th that they reactively are imprinted and correlate with, you know, the sort of the signs that they see in their environment. So it's, it's a sort of, it, it, it's a um, constant idolatry. It, it, it's, a, it's a permanent fixture of essentially and essentially all they're trying to do is summon social justice you know in in the same way that the fascists thought that they were uh, the, the proponents of social justice for their people um, it is slightly different because in some sense Hitler would have called them useful idiots uh, they are technically proto-fascist um, although you know Proto-fascism does have the full-blown fascistic thing within it. It just supposedly gets ameliorated by a common enemy. So, in as much as that there are common evils, you know, the the the, the Nazis could work with the Japanese, you know. Um, uh, Because the sort of uh, the the proto fascist cradle and sort of uh, uh, broader intellectual sort of co co cohesion uh, that it has within its own system of objects even could c permit that. Um, but it's interesting because the proto fascism, in some sense, has more has more possibility and more ideological purity than fascism. Fascism lends itself to being more um, practical in, in, in a lot of respects, and it even uh, kills a lot of proto-fascists um, uh, because they will get in the way, because their purity, uh, th their idea of freedom essentially, because the proto-fascism uh, is centered around identity, and that identity I mean, e even in Weimar Germany, as as the Nazis were gaining cultural ground, uh, many people sympathized with the Nazis, but thought that they were stupid. Um, they thought that they've got some of the progressive message because they really were the same kind of progressive. Uh, that, that, but they didn't quite have it. I mean, this is why so many gays joined the Nazi movement because uh, they made the compromise. They said, well, actually, if we're actually going to have a radical revolutionary agenda and we're going to sort of achieve what we want in terms of the proto-fascist ideals, uh, we're going to have to do it politically somehow. And so we're going to have to compromise and, and sort of, uh, and they were even protected within the Nazi movement. Lots of the high ranking gay Nazis were, were protected for, for very long. Um, until eventually the sort of the propaganda changed and they said, no, no, they're, they're actually sort of infected with the Jewish conspiracy um, that they've internalized and, and they're part of the infiltration. And so we have to sort of um, purge them. And so, you know, uh, but I mean, you know, this is the problem is that it has to continually fight it has to continually purge itself it has to continually be on a sort of cleansing process of progress if it if it can't do something if it, if it in fact if it isn't being threatened existentially it's hard to even keep the whole hysterical apparatus alive and you know you can already see culturally how these people are are 
agonizing, oh, they're, they're self agonizing in their ideological projection. You know, it, 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 they're, they're completely uh, enveloped in their subconsciousness. Um, you know, zombies is, 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 a, is a good sort of, but I mean, in terms of their belief structure, I mean, they have, I think, every, uh, uh, they have every moral charge laid against them uh, validly that they are guilty of their own um, corruption. Uh, they have acceded uh, uh, to these, uh, um, uh, you, you, to this procession of of um, uh, of denial and repression of of life itself, of the way of life, uh, which they are antithetical to, and they are par parasitic, and in and which they target uh, for um, for their sadistically edged uh uh you know sort of baited uh, uh entrapments and and their projections and things like that you know they're just so primed to to attach their uh, uh tautological vectors because they have to if if they don't find fresh blood if they don't uh, make the fire grow you know if the fire isn't getting bigger it's dying and and that is the um, the edge of madness th that they are the incarnation of essentially. Um, okay. Anyway, uh, let me stop being poetical about um, uh, the lost souls who have uh, led themselves uh, with their itching ears, but. Um, Who have led themselves astray. Okay. Um, is there anything more that I should say? Uh, I was going to make a point, and this is somewhat disparate to all the psychological stuff um, about economics, but this is to make a parallel. For instance, so the um, the kind of Marxist storytelling that I, the so-called Marxist storytelling that I have seen, you know, from like David Wolf and things like that. And, and from, um, I read his name recently, but I'm going to mess it up too much. So I don't want to say it. Um, uh, and I'm probably going to say his first name and not his second name, which would also be rude. Um, uh, but the, the professor who I was, uh, responding to, um, And this sort of adds on to my complaint that essentially the, these people are helping uh, to abolish the middle class and 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 the freedom that the middle class represent and the the responsibility, the idea that you can actually change your own fate and that you can be upwardly mobile and that you can create things and create enterprise and create innovation. Obviously, access to opportunity and the potential for innovation within a system is what keeps upward mobility and sort of, and keeps almost a, a healthy um, component of, um, of, of sort of being able to say that the society, to at least at some extent, um, people are capable of helping themselves by taking on responsibility. Um, obviously, a government, therefore, is is uh, very uh, behooved to supply people access to opportunity and to keep the things fluid in such a way so as to um, allow for people when they uh, do the right things uh, that, that, that um, you know, Obviously, because of the kind of policy considerations uh, that have been implemented uh, in league with the identity politics, which has effectively empowered corrupt politicians to centralize power, centralize resources, um, empower big businesses, which effectively are the only entities that can cope with their kind of regulation, which, which you know, because they force these all institutions to take responsibility for history and to sort of gerrymander consequences of history and treat people like tokens. And so in the breakdown of a kind of, of, of an actual 
market uh, and, and consent and having people have a freedom of association and move fluidly between things and, and develop skills and competences. Uh, you know, essentially, we just don't even have any small and medium businesses because they've all been gutted uh, by just the toxic conditions and externalities by the stupid policy, effectively. So, you know, if you hire a black professional and you give them experience, they will get headhunted. So in order to retain your staff as a small business, you have to pay a premium if you hire a, a, a black uh, uh, employee. Um, and, and if you actually uh, empower them essentially to become a skilled worker, you, then you have to pay a premium in order to retain them because they're going to get headhunted by these big companies that have to fill their quotas so that they can get their points. So they've completely destroyed the ladder by creating that perverse incentive effectively because for a small business to lose a staff member who it perhaps takes them three years to train them very to be very proficient at their job, it takes years to train someone to actually get really good and effective and efficient, highly efficient at their job. It takes many years. And then at the point at which they actually start, you know, um, contributing, uh, uh, let's say, um, to the point at which, you know, because essentially what small businesses do is they are paying their staff not for what they deliver, but what for but what they will deliver after they become proficient at their role. And then at that point, essentially, they get headhunted and they can't retain the staff. And it's a disaster for them because small businesses, if they have to start with a new person, then they never get to the point where their business actually starts to take off, where it starts to be able to potentially grow and become a medium and larger sort of business. And so... You know, many entrepreneurs uh, th th that I have known, um, you know, essentially say it's just devastating to try to do business in this country. Um, it, the, the labor market has essentially been poisoned by this political poison and this identity consciousness, which develops effectively in order to facilitate and to justify, um, you know, the, the kind of very poisonous interpersonal uh, consequences of having to essentially put up with people taking on a token role, you know, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, it gets very borderline, you know, it, it really feeds into this narcissistic thing. Um, and, you know, the, the kind of overzealous labor restrictions have also not helped, um, you know, to the extent to which unions, you know, they are very irresponsible. You know, there are very many good examples of good unions. But if unions have too much power, um, you know, you really have to, to, to actually, I mean, obviously, you can never get it just right. So perhaps you have to get the pendulum to swing both ways. And if the pendulum is not able to swing both ways, if, if uh, regulators and policymakers aren't able to sort of uh, make an adjustment because of structural problems that unions are causing, for instance, and then after it overcorrects, then you give the unions more power. If you're not able to dial it both ways, you know, then you really have no incentive to actually find a workable middle ground and a workable medium um, uh, in which to actually uh, uh, solve certain things. But uh, sorry, uh, I'm just sort of ranting now, but uh, let, let me get back to the point. Uh, the point that I was going to make is, is that because essentially government is not interested in increasing access to people. In fact, they, within South Africa, it's quite disgusting. They, on purpose, did not deliver books to rural schools because essentially they wanted to keep people undeveloped so that they could continue to complain about, I guess, white monopoly capital and ensure a rural voting bloc with promises that, that, that effectively, promises, always promises in the future of development and they never get voted against for the, for the, for the non-delivery and the, and the unaccountable governance, essentially. Um, and this is all facilitated, essentially, by black pride. Um, so, you know, essentially, we are paying through the nose for the notion of black pride and the restoration of black pride and the project of the restoration of black pride is the devastation and 
the, the removal of transformation and development and instead we get this racialized consciousness instead and so racialized consciousness goes through the roof that's what we're actually building in this country we're, we're building a, a fascist regime and and its cultural implements um and uh politics is reflecting that we have a weak president who cannot even uh, uh consistently talk honestly about non-racialism he says some very nice things about non-racialism and in his second and third breath he he says a whole lot of irreconcilable garbage that can never square with the non-racialist sentiments that he just mouthed you know it's just window dressing it's just uh, uh you know in the same way that i'm sure hitler said a lot of nice things that made the democrats in america uh, think that he was a marvelous person um because, you know, there's really no real difference in the kind of paternalism and the kind of irresponsibility that they like to to hand to to their subjects to, that will then have to owe them fealty via the, the vehicle of, of this identity. And, and, you know, I mean, it, this is also why you have to understand that the Democratic Party was always the party of the Ku Klux Klan and they have not changed their values and their culture. They have merely found new... Uh, sort of ideological guises and such. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is what happens when generalizations are the nexus of your worldview uh, and, and statistics and such. Okay.